And Thank now you. we're going to move to uh, the last speaker of the day. So Kirsten Tentescher, who is Professor of Computational Developmental Biology at Utrecht University. And Kirsten will tell us about reverse engineering lateral root formation. So thanks for having me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about has already for uh, a little bit ago been uh, published in development. And it was actually work from two of my PhD students, Johanna Santos Texera and Thea van den Berg. But well, they both finished and left academia. So this is, I guess, why you are stuck with me. So in my group, we are very interested in understanding the development of the plant root system and um, particularly using multi-scale modeling uh, to contribute to that understanding. And well, as you can see in this picture, plant root systems are typically branched and these branchings arise from so-called lateral roots. And what is interesting about these lateral roots is that they don't emerge on the outside of the plant, but rather they arise from the inside of the plant. So lateral roots, they originate from a tissue that is overlaying the vasculature of the plant. And the earliest sign is sort of asymmetric division. Then you get a number of uh, periclinal divisions forming this sort of dome. And then as this dome grows and develops, it really has to push and fight its way through overlaying tissues to emerge into the soil and start to contribute to foraging for nutrients and water. Now, these stages that I just described from this initial asymmetric division onward, for those we have um, molecular markers, and also under a microscope, we can see that something is happening. But oh, as I said, um, what is happening is that some cells overlaying the vasculature start doing this. And the processes that set apart which cells are going to do this are much less understood. And the problem is there that we don't have clear molecular markers, and that we also don't have a way to morphologically discern these cells. So what we do know, and this is very intriguing for people, for example, familiar with vertebrate somatogenesis, is that uh, in the tip of plant roots, just above the meristem where there are the stem cells and the cell divisions, there is a so-called oscillation zone where oscillations in the plant hormone auxin in the signaling thereof are occurring. And the debate in the field has been a bit is this actual oscillations in the levels of this hormone, or is it rather oscillations in the perception machinery, so in the signaling itself of this auxin hormone? Well, as for vertebrate somatogenesis, these temporal oscillations are true growth transduced into this repetitive pattern of so-called pre-branch sites, which are the cells that receive competence to form future lateral roots, even though, as you can see with the star, not all of them will actually do that because plants have to be plastic. They have to respond to their environment. What you also see in this picture with this pre-branch site is that, well, there is high auxin in the meristem. That is what cells need to divide. There is then periodic high auxin in this oscillation zone, but you see it dipping a bit and then if you actually form this pre-branch site, it goes up again. So that implies that you have to be primed, but a secondary process has to be invoked to give you the memory and to actually be able to memorize that you're this primed cell and you might be able to form this lateral root. Well, as said, in my group, we use multi-scale modeling to try and answer these type of questions, what is going on there. So what we typically do for these kinds of models is that we, uh, we make a root anatomy. So we take into account this sort of pointy shape with a root cap protecting the stem cells. Uh, we take into account the different zones of the root and the different cell types. And then as illustrated here, we take from the literature, uh, for example, expression patterns and polarity patterns of uh, auxin exporters, which have a very typical pattern. So they're membrane proteins exporting auxin, and they're not localized all around on the membrane, but in the vasculature, so in the middle, they point downward. In the root tip, they are sort of apolar. And then on the sides, they're upward and inward. And people have been calling this a sort of reverse fountain or reflux loop for auxin. Well, like we include this for exporters, we also include experimentally derived patterns for auxin importers, for auxin production. Um, and when we model these auxin dynamics and we do similar things for gene expression, and this gives us 
detailed uh, spatial patterns um, of auxin and also um, other hormones and other uh, and genes depending on that. But that's only one side of the coin. At the other side of the coin is also that we model um, root growth dynamics. So typically in the orange zone where um, we have the stem cell niche, we ignore divisions there because they're very, very slow. But then the very first few stem cells, we allow them to divide, still slow. And then as we move up in this light yellow zone, we have these so-called ampl transit amplifying divisions. So cells divide rapidly. Then they go to the dark green, they still grow slowly, no longer divide. In the yellow, they do what plant cells do. They take up a lot of water and they elongate. And then finally, in the blue zone, they stop elongating and they differentiate, which in the model doesn't mean so much, but which in practice could mean that outer cells make root hairs to increase their surface or inner cells die to make the vasculature. Okay. So in a paper basically preceding um, this paper, we uh, found to our surprise that with these two ingredients, having all the details of auxin transport and metabolism in, and the details of um, root growth in, we get automatically oscillations in auxin dynamics. So what are you looking at here? So you see a bit uh, shaded out, uh, a snapshot of the auxin dynamics. And then what we did is we draw a vertical line through one particular cell file and take the auxin levels there and then do that every so many seconds. And the purple lines are the cell walls. So you see this curvature that's just cells being displaced upward as new cells are forming below them. And you see that we get these regular peaks in auxin. And you also see that if you do this for different cell types, that the, the most strong peaks are in the vasculature, which is consistent with where um, lateral root pre-branch sites are being formed. And I don't have the time to explain it here, but it's basically this reflux loop forming a loading zone of auxin above the meristem, combined with periodic changes in the size with which cells arrive in this loading zone and therefore can take up auxin, that is giving rise to these oscillations. So in the current article, we wanted to say like, okay, but how do they memorize these oscillations? So basically we extended the model with a longer differentiation zone. And then you clearly see what is priming is not enough because it doesn't matter if you are this first blue cell having a little bit of um, auxin or if you're uh, later on in the sequence and you are the cell with the red auxin profile. At the end of the day, for each and every one of them, the auxin levels dissipate. So even the ones receiving most auxin cannot hold on to it, cannot memorize it. So, well, as a theoretical biologist, we just heard these things about bistability and positive feedbacks. So that's then also uh, the kind of logical thing to go to. So we know that early on in lateral root formation, we have an upregulation of auxin importers, AUX1, LEX3, and also of auxin producing enzymes like UCA4. So we decided to make a positive feedback loop because we know they are auxin induced. And we do that with a little bit of delay because we know we have to have this response secondarily. So only once a certain differentiation threshold is reached. But sadly, if we compare the dashed with the solid lines, that didn't make much of a difference. And this makes sense because we have growth in our model. So basically, these cells are continuously being pushed away from the zone of the root where you have high auxin. So this positive feedback has to work against the context in which you lose auxin constantly. So then we said, well, but we have this debate in the field. Other people have been saying it's not so much auxin levels themselves, but it's the auxin signaling machinery that is changing. So we thought, well, maybe actually both sides of the debate are right, and it's just a matter of in which phase of the process you are. So what if, as a positive feedback effect, also again with this delay of first having to differentiate a bit, we upregulate an auxin response factor? and thereby we increase our sensitivity to, to this auxin hormone. Well, that worked like a charm, but unfortunately we now see that uh, the, the purple and blue cells that start off with little auxin, so they are not primed, and the red and pink cell, the ones that receive most auxin during priming, they all undergo this secondary response. So this is working a bit too well, right? Because now we lose our distinction between which cells actually received the initial sick will and which cells didn't. So that was a bit of a pity. 
But then we were reading a very inspiring article, which was basically about the other side of the plant, about um, patterning leaf primordia, which is called phyllotaxis. And this is again a repetitive process. It is again driven by auxin maxima. And here the experimental data were showing that the cells that are actually starting the transcriptional program to form a leaf are not the cells that at that moment in time have the highest auxin level, but that those are cells that temporally integrated over time have seen the, much, the most auxin signal. So we thought, hey, that makes a lot of sense because, well, all our cells see auxin, but some a bit more than others. So at each moment in time, it makes a little bit of a difference. But if you integrate that over time, you have a much more clearer distinction. So we assumed that this is some sort of epigenetic process, hence our variable epio, epigenetic open state. And we assume that slowly, if auxin levels are high enough, this state goes from zero to one, it opens. And only when you have substantial opening, these other guys, this auxin response capacity, the importers and the producers of auxin, they get engaged. Now we see that indeed the EPIO variable is much more distinctive than the actual auxin. And we see that now, if we look at auxin signaling, it's only these two guys uh, that received initially the highest auxin levels, the red one and the pink one, that undergo a strong secondary response. And this you can also see in these snapshots here. So you see uh, from an early event happening, but you see also higher up a later event with this EPO being switched on and the ARFs being switched on, Yucca and LUX3 and AUX1 being switched on. And this translating into a very clear response in terms of auxin signaling, but due to the low auxin levels, not in auxin itself. So this was quite nice. Now, there were a few issues remaining, namely, priming occurs on two sides in Arabidopsis because you have two xylem poles. But if you saw this initial picture with the wavy root and laterals on either one side or the other, the, this pre branch side and this lateral root formation only occurs on one side. And also, it typically starts with only one cell. So we have to get rid of the pink brother and we have to get rid of one of the two sides. So what we did there is we assumed that there is a little bit of noise, and this can be in an auxin importer, in an auxin producer, or in auxin sensing. And that is sufficient to break symmetry, to get a competition for auxin going, and to have only one side remember that it's being primed. And also we included a sort of lateral inhibition type mechanism. Quite a few of those are known and we incorporated one of them. And that is sufficient to go from the pink and the uh, red line to often only the, the red line remembering this priming signal. And this is just to compare um, the chymographs that typically come from our simulations where you also see this going down from two prime cells to one cell gradually losing the signal. And if you would tilt that chymograph and you would augment it because you would follow what is happening to cells longer, that then you get something that is very similar to the experimental chymographs. So concluding, we think that this priming is an emergent property that arises from the interplay between growth and oxygen transport. And because the vasculature cells are the most narrow, they profit the most from periodic variations in cell size. So that's why they show this clearest signal. And what we also show is that while priming itself requires auxin, the memorization requires an upregulation of auxin signaling, reconciling a prior debate. And we think it is very nice that, uh, at least we hypothesize that also in this periodic auxin patterning mechanism on the other side of the plant, temporal integration would enable a much more robust distinction of which cell should form a lateral root. And that then with a few more details of lateral inhibition and noise, you can really fully explain uh, this patterning process. And with that, I would like to end and thank everybody that has been or is in my lab and my collaborators. Thanks a lot. Okay, so are there any questions, please? <coughs> okay, maybe I'm going to start uh, 
uh, with, uh, with a question of, of my own. So um, I, I find very interesting that you have this time integration of a parameter. And if I relate to the first talk, for instance, where there was discussion about control parameter of a bifurcation uh, and pseudo time. So would you say that this time integration would ac actually work like a pseudo time uh, inducing a bifurcation or is it a completely different process? Ooh, that I find hard to, I think here it really helps, um, well, to, to get a clearer distinction, but I think what it also really does in this process is because you have this space-time integration, so maybe the, the cell having the second highest auxin, it arrives earlier in the elongation and differentiation zone. So if you would start differentiation based on, oh, I have quite some high auxin levels compared to my neighbors, and then the guy arrives, um, which, which actually has the highest oxygen levels. So in order to make sure that that process works okay, also it helps a lot to do this sort of temporal integration, because then the difference between these two guys is much clearer, and it's much easier to guarantee that indeed the one that initially received the highest oxygen level will also really go for the developmental decision. But, well, in a sense, of course, it does yeah, it is a control parameter engaging then the next bifurcation of setting in motion this positive feedback and memorizing or not memorizing. Okay, thanks a lot. So there is uh, another question by by uh, the panelists on the panelist side. So um, I think that's for, from Alex. Uh, have you looked at available genetic data to see if there's any in vivo evidence that supports the uh, e e e EPIO, EPIO parameter, EPIO parameter? Well, um, I would love to, but actually that is uh, quite uh, difficult. So um, the thing is that these lateral roots, they emerge from this, this um, pericycle. And it's just a very few cells. So even if you do single cell transcriptomics, the whole problem is that prior at this stage, we don't have another molecular marker or a clear anatomical sign yet. So you're really fishing for a needle in a haystack. So of course, my hopes would be that if now we get better detailed data, single omics data from early stages of lateral route, you pick up on something and then maybe you can do convince somebody to do targeted experiments and say okay this guy is actually engaging earlier on but it's a it's very non-trivial uh, to, to get a hold of that precisely because of this lack of uh, marker and this um, very low numbers compared to the total cell number you have of this cell type okay thanks a lot